Hey everyone, Christian here and today we're diving into one of the most exciting topics I've recently been working on in my home lab. Because I've just finished building a new Proxmox server in addition to my current one and I thought, well, why not connect those two Proxmox servers together and form a Proxmox cluster? This allows me to unite all the power of my servers, migrate VMs from one node to another and even achieve high availability of all my services. And I know this sounds absolutely incredible, but I can tell you it took me quite a while to figure out how it all works. There are really a lot of pitfalls when you want to do that, but it has also been a lot of fun and I really enjoyed the learning progress. So let's get into it. I'm going to show you all the traps that lie ahead when you want to build a Proxbox cluster with two nodes and what I've learned from this project. I hope you're gonna enjoy it. Though before we do that, I have another very cool thing I need to show you and thanks Incogni for sponsoring this video. Because I believe everybody here in our tech community is aware of the problem with personal data collection online and the potential risk associated with it, such as information leaks, spam emails, phishing attacks or targeted scams. This is all done by data brokers that collect and sell all your personal information online whenever you fill out a form or sign up on a shady website. I'm pretty sure we all know how this game works. But that doesn't mean that we have to accept this. We all have the right to request the deletion of our data and in fact most of these companies will do that. However, as you can imagine, this is a pretty time consuming and also annoying challenge to reach out to each and every data broker yourself, but don't worry, I'm going to show you a very cool solution called Incogni that will do exactly that for you. Incogni will reach out to all of those data brokers on your behalf, request the removal of your personal data immediately and even fight with any objections for you. Everything is fully automated and it's super simple. All you have to do is sign up with an account, enter the information that you want to be removed, give Incogni the right to work on your behalf and sit back and relax. <laughs> You can log into your Incogni account at any time to check the progress and get more details about all the data brokers that have your personal information and also the status of your removal request. So definitely check it out. Use my code Christian Lampa at the link below to get an exclusive 60% off an annual Incogni plan. Okay, now let's get back to topic and talk about my new Proxmox server. First, I want to show you how I've built this and what additional hardware I bought for it, because in the last video, I already showed you the Minis Photon BD770i, a really powerful and efficient IDX mainboard I've used for this build. It comes with an AMD Ryzen CPU that has 8 cores and 16 threads. It's incredibly powerful but also very power efficient and for me personally it was just a no-brainer that I have to use this mainboard for a new Proxmox server build. My plan is to use this new server to run it 24-7 for all my production VMs and shut down my current Proxmox server overnight to save some power. The clustering allows me to migrate any virtual machine at any time and use the secondary node whenever I need additional resources. For example, I'm still running my NAS here and all of my demo environments, but the main services of my home lab, like the main Docker and Kubernetes servers, I want to run on the new Minis Forum hardware. Uh, by the way, if you want to get some additional details about the performance testing and all the other components I've tested on this new server, then check out my review of the Minis Forum board. I've put your link in the description down below. I also got a brand new server case for it. This time I wanted to try out something new because all my other server cases I got in my home lab were from Intertech. And those cases are somewhat okay, but um, they look kind of boring in my opinion. And because I wanted to switch from a three unit server case to a smaller two unit server case, I've decided to buy a different brand. This time I've tried out the RM23502 Mini from Silverstone, which definitely is a really nice case. It's not the cheapest one I have to admit, but you absolutely will notice a difference in quality between this Silverstone case and my older Intertech ones, which are a bit cheaper. For example, what I really like about it is that this server case is very small and lightweight, but you still can put a full ATX power supply into it. You can see it even has some airflow on the top of the case that in my opinion makes it perfect for any home server build based on desktop hardware. You could also very easily mount any additional SSDs or HDDs if you like and it does have enough slots for lower profile PCIe cards. 
Everything else has also a pretty good quality. For example, I didn't notice any sharp edges as some of my other Intertech cases sometimes had. So I'm very satisfied with this server case from Silverstone. By the way, you will also find this on my kit page if you want to buy it. The Minis Forum ITX mainboard fits in pretty well. I've also added a 10 gigabit SFP plus network card into the PCI Express slot and then mounted it into my server rack right above my current Proxmox server. And because I already installed the Proxmox OS for testing purposes in my last video, I didn't need to do anything else here. So I just connected the internal network port to my management network and the 10 gigabit connector to my switch. Then I've simply opened a connection from my workstation to both of the Proxmox server UIs. The Minis Forum, by the way, will become the first node, so I've called it PRX Production 1. And my current Proxmox server has the name PRX Production 2. That is the one that currently has all the VMs running on it. Now, before you get too excited and immediately start building the cluster, you should definitely first check out the official documentation of the Proxmox Cluster Manager, because there are a few important things that you have to take care of, otherwise you might run into problems later. The most important thing that you should first check is whether your servers can connect to each other over the network, of course. So you have to allow UDP connections for CoroSync, so that's the synchronization service Proxmox is using, and you also have to allow SSH connections as well. Also the date and time config should be accurate on both nodes and they should have the same Proxmox version. That wasn't the case for me so the first thing I needed to do was updating both nodes so they both were running on the same version 8.1.10. It is also recommended that you use a separate network interface port as a dedicated link between these nodes. So in my case, both nodes have two SFP plus network cards and also the internal network interface on the main board. So in total, I got three network interfaces. And what I've done is I've configured the first 10 gigabit network port as a member of the virtual bridge interface. So this is where I usually connect all my virtual machines to the 10.20.0060 network. And the other port I've just directly connected to both nodes and configured a separate IP address range for it, the 10.91, which I'm using for the dedicated link. I'm not sure though if Proxbox really need that fast connection for Corosync. I'm pretty sure you could also have used the internal network of the main board for the dedicated link. But uh, because I'm already using this for my separate management VLAN with the 10.50.0.0.16 network, I thought having a third network interface just for the dedicated link between the nodes isn't a bad thing. And the faster it is, the better it is. What I didn't notice at this point though was if you want to migrate virtual machines from one node to another, they also should have the same virtual bridge interface configuration, which wasn't the case here because on the Medis Forum node, I just configured the VM bridge zero interface. On my current Proxmox server, I have two VM bridge interfaces, the VM bridge zero and one. And I'm using the VM bridge one for all my VMs on the current node, but I'll show you later what I mean and how I fix this problem. By the way, also both nodes should have their final hostname and IP address configuration at this point because it's not possible to change those settings later. And yeah, once you carefully went through all of those requirements, hope you didn't miss anything, you can create the Proxmox cluster. It's actually pretty simple. You just have to go to your main Proxmox node that has all the virtual machines and configs. In my case, that was the Proxmox node 2. And then I just navigate to data center, click on create cluster, give it a cluster name, make sure the cluster network has selected the correct network interface. And then you should see the Coruscant config is created and the server service is started. You can also see the cluster name in this menu here. By the way, I just later noticed that my stupid autocorrection changed the cluster name from PRX to PRE. But uh, yeah, it's not a big deal. I can just call it PRE for Proxmox environment. So I think that just sounds as it was intended. <laughs> anyway, to connect your secondary node, you can look up the join information on the primary node, copy this information. And on the secondary node, you just go to data center, cluster menu, and click on join cluster. 
Then paste in the information you got from the first node, set the peer address and the root password. Also make sure you are using the correct cluster network link and this will then join your node to your Proxmox cluster. After that is done, you should see both nodes in the cluster menu. Also in the server view, you can expand the drop down menu on both of your nodes and manage any of those nodes from any node in the cluster. That was pretty easy, right? By the way, if you want to check the current status of your cluster on the shell, you can also type in the command pvecm for Proxmox cluster manager status. And this will show you the current cluster information, the config version, the quorum information with the voting settings, more about that in a minute. And of course, the active member nodes of your cluster. When you need to troubleshoot something because you got some errors, it's also useful to know the journal CTL command for Corosync. So here you might find any error logs when something didn't work as expected. Okay, so now that I got the Proxmox cluster running and everything seems to be operational, I just try to migrate a single virtual machine from the current Proxmox node to the new Minis Forum node. I'm using a temporary VM just for testing purposes. On the right side, you can see I'm also pinging this virtual machine to see if it remains accessible during the migration and how long it stays offline. Now, if you start the migration and you don't have a shared storage for your VMs, you also have to choose a new target storage because the virtual disk is currently located on the node 2 and if you want to start that VM on the node 1 it first needs to copy the disk of course. But once I started the migration I ran into this problem with the bridge interface because the virtual machine was connected to the VM bridge 1 interface of the node 2 which wasn't existing on the node 1 yet. But luckily I could easily change the network configuration on the node 1 so I've created a new bridge interface for the VMs so that it now mirrors the exact same configuration as on the node 2 and then the migration did work flawless. You can see that when the migration starts the virtual machine still remains active on the node 2 so it first copies the entire virtual machine disk and also the virtual machine memory when it's running. This is by the way called an online migration and once it copied over the data it will shut down the virtual machine on node 2 and start it up on node 1 with just a very minimal downtime it even doesn't require a full reboot you can see the ping request only failed three times until the machine was online again and this is really cool i can't say how much i love this feature and it is super useful to me because when i want to shut down the secondary node but i still want to run some virtual machines i can easily migrate them over to the first node within just a few seconds. One thing though I have to say at this point, this online migration is not supported when both nodes haven't the same CPU model. And since my MIDI's forum node of course has an AMD CPU and the secondary node has an Intel CPU, it isn't really safe to do this. In this case it worked for me, but for whatever reason on a different virtual machine I've got some problems. The VM was frozen after the migration and I needed to manually reboot it until it worked again. So this is one thing that is mentioned in the Proxmox Cluster Manager Guide and you should definitely pay attention to it. If you need the online migration you should make sure that both nodes have the same CPU model. Alternatively if you don't have that you could also always go the safe route, shut down the VM, take it back up, copy it over to the other node and then restore it. That's also called an offline migration and that will always work no matter what hardware you're using on your nodes. But as you can see, it is actually pretty simple to create and use a Proxmox cluster with two nodes. It gives you some really nice features like the central management, the online migration and so on. The problem though with this setup is if you're interested in high availability, here a two node Proxmox cluster is definitely not the recommended setup. I've tried adding a VM into the HA menu section of Proxmox so that when the node dies where the VM is running, Proxmox should automatically migrate it over to the other node. With only two nodes, you will see this error message here in the HA menu. At least three quorum votes are recommended for reliable HA. The easiest way to solve this is just installing a third Proxmox node and join it to the cluster. This also gives you some additional benefits like building a distributed storage with a Ceph. But because I didn't want to buy another computer just to get HA functionality, I went with a much simpler solution and that is by using a Q device. A Q device is a lightweight service daemon that you can install on any Linux machine and it will act as another voting member of the cluster. 
I've installed this service on my Zima board, which runs 24 seven anyway. So this is just perfect for this task. And to install the Q device, I just had to follow the Proxmox documentation. So here I've opened an SSH connection to my Zima board and installed the Corosync QNet D packages. Then you have to install the Corosync Q device packages on both Proxmox nodes in your cluster. So I've done that on Proxmox node one and two as well. And then you just have to run the following command PVECM Q device setup on any of your nodes, enter the IP address of the Q device, which can be in a different network than the dedicated link is by the way, and it will automatically do the entire setup process for you. Once that is done, you can see the Q device as an additional member of your cluster, not as a full node though, but as a voting member. And this allows me to add the testing virtual machine in the HA menu and I didn't get this error message anymore. And I've also done another test by just taking the first Proxmox node down and waiting for the virtual machine to be migrated to the secondary node. Now this surprisingly took quite a long time until the cluster noticed that the first node was down and once it tried to start it on the secondary node. It also ran into another problem, of course, because yeah, with this project I always ran into problems. <laughs> The issue now was that the virtual disk of this virtual machine was still present on the first node. And of course, since I've taken it offline, the secondary node couldn't first copy the VM disk to successfully start the virtual machine. Now you will already guess it, at this point you must have shared storage, otherwise you can never achieve a full HA scenario in a two node Proxmox cluster. Of course, I've also some ideas to solve this problem in the future. You could do that with a separate NAS device running NFS, for example, where you can access your virtual machine disks from. Of course, this requires a really fast storage and a fast network connection as well. So definitely 10 gigabit and maybe also a NAS with SSDs. I'm not sure if most people have that. Well, I personally don't, at least yet, but maybe that sounds like a pretty cool project for the second half of the year, right? But for me personally, the missing H a functionality isn't such a big deal because I don't really need it in my Proxbox cluster. I just wanted to have the ability to migrate VMs and have the central management functionality, but it was still interesting to play around with it and finding out what I need to build in the future to achieve full HA in my entire home lab. So yeah, these were my tests so far. I hope this gave you some clarity about a two node Proxmox cluster setup. It was really a lot of fun and I'm pretty excited about the future projects with this. At some day, I'm definitely going to build a fast SSD NAS storage for this, or maybe even adding a third Proxmox node for having a distributed storage with Ceph. I believe these are pretty exciting project ideas that I'm going to start looking at in the second half of this year. So you have to be a bit patient with me, but now it's your turn. So please tell me if you're running a Proxbox cluster yourself in your home lab or if you're interested in by following my tutorial. Did I miss any important topics that we need to cover in upcoming videos? Let me know and as always thank you so much for watching. A big thanks goes out to all the supporters on Patreon. You guys helped me out so much making those free tutorials for you and I'm gonna catch you in the next video. Take care everybody. Bye bye.